Hi everybody, I'm Scott, and you'll never guess what I'm going to look at today. DMX. This is my first foray into DMX. Um, I mean, I'm familiar with it, but I've never actually used any DMX equipment down here in my basement. And I bought four of these Chauvet, Chauvet, Chauvet. Okay, if you're American, it's probably like Chauvet. If you're French, it's Chauvet. I'm going to go with Chauvet. I don't know how you pronounce the brand. But uh, they're DMX4 dimmer packs. But they're also switch packs, which is important because most of my lights down here are not dimmable. And one of the reasons I went with these specifically, besides the fact that they had pretty good ratings, is that they're compatible with LED light bulbs in switch mode. So this way I can just turn on and off LED lights without issue. Apparently, I mean, according to their marketing materials anyway, other dimmer packs slash switch packs have issues with LED bulbs. And I also have a lot of CFLs, so I'm hoping they'll work with CFLs as well nicely. I actually only have one dimmable light, and it is over there. It's the only incandescent light in this whole place. It's a hair light for, you know, my hair. See that brilliant glow on half my head? And also where the hairline's receding, it just makes my head shine. Perfect. So just a quick look at the marketing materials. It's a four-channel dimmer relay pack providing DMX control for on-off dimming to units not equipped with DMX on their own, which is every single one of my lights, hence these packs. And I should just note, I have about 20-ish lights down here. So between these four packs, I'll have 16 channels, which is fine because some of them can be doubled up on the same channel. And uh, that should be enough for changing lighting scenes and moods down here. Not that I'm trying to create like a mood room down here. It's more like just for different scenes and different types of lighting. I get a lot of glare off some of these lights, so I'd like to be able to turn some of them on and off individually. Also, if I'm shooting with a still camera, like for the, well, YouTube cover images, but also for eBay sales and other stuff that I do in my basement, um, a different lighting setup is preferred. And right now I have to go around and switch on and off all these lights. And when I say all these lights, I mean like, there's a lot of lights, and then there's uh, lights on the floor to light the whole background up, like red and blue, in other words, purple. And then behind there, there's a red light and another blue light to put a wash behind the servers. That's not even a comprehensive look. Maybe I'll take pictures of each one and show them. I don't have like a good camera set up right now to give you an angle on all the lights, because obviously they're not meant to be on camera, right? Well, except for that, except for that red one back there. Back there. That one's always in shot for some reason. I really got to change that, but whatever. So yeah, here's the product highlights if you want to pause on here. I'm not going to be using any of the built-in sequencing features and the specifications. It actually is multi-voltage. One weird thing is that one weird thing is that on the electrical specs here, it says that each channel is up to 5 amps, whereas on the actual boxes, they're fused for 7 amps. Not a huge difference, just a weird inconsistency. Um, obviously these, the whole unit is only rated for 15 amps and I'll show you the power cord that goes to it. It's a 14 gauge cord. So really you wouldn't put more than 15 amps through this thing, but each channel is individually fused at seven amps. Of course, these DMX boxes are useless without some kind of controller. And that's what this is. Now I didn't want a full lighting desk. I have very little room down here for one, nor do I need one. I don't need really precise control over each individual light. And I certainly don't need a multitude of dimmers because the lights aren't dimmable. So this is a single RU mountable uh, computer interface for DMX, which also, importantly for me, has a bunch of keys on the front. I think it has 16 buttons on the front for 16 pre-selected scenes. So this way I don't have to take up a huge amount of space in my racks. It's just one unit and I can choose between 16 scenes. Perfect for me. And this is from ADJ. It's called MyDMX-RM. This comes with software or the software downloadable for this which you can use to set up elaborate lighting scenes and sequences. You can dim lights, you know, do all sorts of other stuff. Well, dimming isn't that exciting, but you can dim them in sequence. You can dim them in patterns. You could flash them on and off. All the other, all the things you can do with DMX, you can do with that software. Apparently, it takes the place of a lighting desk. I'm not going to get deep into the software in this review because, or in this whatever the hell this is, because it's uh, not really germane to what I'm using it for, but I will give you a quick tour of the software and let you know if it's at least has a baseline of goodness to it, which I kind of doubt because this wasn't that expensive and the software is free. So uh, we'll take that for what it's worth. And as long as we're looking at marketing materials, here's the MyDMX RM. It can be used standalone or with a computer. 
which is, like I said, great for me. You can program it with the computer and then have it be a standalone device to turn things on and off or start and stop sequences. And on the front are these 16 buttons, apparently. So without further ado, uh, let me break into one of these boxes and let's see what's up with the packaging and the boxing and the unboxing. Box, this box got a little smooshed in transit, but these do feel like fairly rugged devices, so I'm sure nothing's wrong with them. Bubble wrap and plastic wrap. Cool. And there we have it, the Chauvet DJ DMX4 dimmer switch pack. And it has a menu facility on the front for setting the DMX channels associated with this. And you can kind of see what's going on here. So you can set the address or range of addresses personality for each channel and uh, whether it's switch or dimmer and program run speed dimmer i think that's for internal yeah that's for standalone mode and like i said i'm just gonna be using it in dmx mode also in the box are a couple of stickers a quick reference guide the full manual is available online this is not it and and a power cord which like i said is a Nice, heavy-duty feeling, solid 14-gauge cable. Um, some of these cables, you know, they come from China. They come from cheap places. They say 14-gauge. They're not. This one certainly, I would expect, is, in fact, 14-gauge. So don't always trust what these cables say, except when they come from a reputable manufacturer or with equipment from a reputable manufacturer. Ooh, remember how I said that box was a little squished in transit? Uh, I guess it did bend this a little bit. But not a big deal. One thing I just wanted to note that I read in the manual is that this entire back piece is actually part of this bracket up here. It's all one big piece of metal and you can remove the back, hence this bracket, and flip it around the other way. And as such, then you can hang the unit off of a pipe or some other rigging because the bracket will be facing out and then down this way, uh, which is not what I'm going to be doing. These are all going to be sitting on the floor in my basement, but I just thought I'd note that, that these are suitable for rigging in various circumstances. Like I said, the manual itself is available online. You can easily search for Chauvet DJ DMX4 and it'll come up with the product page, which will have a link to the manual. But just for posterity, this is generally the information. This is actually a multilingual thing, so it's very few pages up in the beginning of English. And it just basically talks about the operation, replacement of fuses, how to switch between dimmer and switch mode, and how to mount it. That's actually in the quick reference guide too. Here's what I was talking about, the alternate rigging. You can flip the back plate around so that the bracket looks like that. And then it gives you a quick walk through the menu options, which I believe is for the most part the same stuff that's on the front of the unit, which I appreciate. because This way you don't have to keep any kind of directions or manual handy. You can refer to it right here. So I guess the best thing to do right now is to power this on. There is a power socket on the bottom as well as an on off switch for the whole unit and then the display has lit up and it's a little bit glary with uh without my hand there so it's set to a001 which is the address i presume and we can set the addresses thusly so i believe i'm going to assign each one of these four addresses so this one will be one to four, the next one will be five to eight, the next one, and et cetera. So I go through the menu, S1 on, so that's S1 switch functionality is on as opposed to dimmer, which is perfect, so it's already set up. So switch two is on, three is on, four is on, and we're on address one. Seems pretty straightforward. Oh, and I should also point out, besides the fuses, we got DMX in and out over here. And that is it for connections, other than, of course, the receptacles, which I'm sure you all saw on the front. And there's two receptacles per channel. Now, if we put it in standalone mode, you can see it's starting to go through a program. Um, and it's just chasing through the channels. Sort of a police light flashing style program. And you can see each of these built-in programs has a different pattern. I could do one better, though, because I want to set these up to test them right here on the bench. So give me one second. Oh, I guess I should talk about this though first. <laughs> I got a Black Friday or Cyber Monday deal where I was buying four LED light bulbs, or so I thought. I actually got four four packs. So I have 16 bulbs, which is perfect for testing this stuff out because I have 16 channels. 
Um, these are the old-fashioned sort of Edison style. And by Edison, I mean the, the fake filaments on the inside. They're obviously Edison screw type as well. And in order to use them, I got these little light bulb adapters. Um, 16 of these as well, but these are dirt cheap. Unfortunately, these are glass, so I actually have to be careful with them. I wish they were plastic so I could just sort of not worry about whacking this thing around. But anyway, let's check it out. I'm going to put it into uh, standalone mode. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, I put up a seizure warning now, because, well, before, because this is quite intense for those of you who might be susceptible. But, yeah, it, it does seem to be switching the LED bulbs just fine. Uh, there's no issue there. And so, yeah, the chase program, different flashing patterns. And I think that's pretty much it for the patterns. I think I got through all of them. Not super important, because as I said, these will be used with DMX, but just so you know sort of what the unit's capable of on its own, so you can just use this by itself. Let me get the rest of these unboxed and set up with light bulbs, and then I will test out the DMX controller. Oh, and later I'm going to open up uh, these things and take a look at what's inside, because I am curious myself. Okay, actually, before I continue with the controller, uh, I did find something out that's kind of cool. Standalone mode is not strictly speaking standalone. It looks like it actually outputs whatever it's doing on one controller to the rest. So I have these chained together right now. And when I activate one of them, it should activate the same pattern on all of them. What I'm going to do here is just change the mode on this one to standalone. And you can see, well, we got flashing on three of them. I don't know why the last one isn't flashing. Maybe it's in the wrong mode? Huh. Well, I got it half working. It looks like I just had accidentally hit the address switch when I was setting it up. But uh, these two bulbs in the end aren't lighting up at all. So channels one and two don't appear to be doing anything, even though these are all set to start at address one. So that's, uh, that's a bit weird, a bit concerning. So maybe this one's faulty, or maybe I did something wrong. We shall find out. And then mode, change back to DMX to stop it. And the others just kind of stop in their tracks. Whatever was lit up when I stopped this one from transmitting is whatever it just landed on. Okay, with the uh, DMX switch boxes out of, out of the way, or dimmer packs, however you want to refer to them, uh, let's check out the controller. Okay, and of course, here is the unit itself. Single rack mount unit, as expected. And on the back, it's got a five pin DMX out and a three pin DMX out. Now, obviously, I'm gonna use the three pin because that's what all these other boxes use. And then it's got a USB port, helpfully labeled serial port. I mean, technically, USB is a universal serial bus, but usually they don't call it a serial port. Actually, you know why they call it that? There might be a USB to serial, like RS-232, chip inside of this unit maybe that's what the deal is and then nine volt input with a locking plug which i actually do quite appreciate the power adapter feels extremely lightweight and cheap like extremely cheap but uh hmm. and actually you know what that's a downside of the locking bracket um i think you could take this plastic piece off that actually does the locking and just be left with a jack so you can use a different power supply with this if you so choose it additionally comes with a USB cable, which actually looks like decent quality because it's got the uh, ferrite rings on it. And also included is a new product quick guide. So another quick start. I believe, again, the full manual is available online on this company's website. Ah, so the software is free with the product. I didn't realize you need to enter a 20 character key to actually download it. And this has a card included, which presumably has the key on it, which I will not be showing you. Well, I won't be showing you the actual code, but that's what the uh, key card looks like anyway. So it's got the code on the back. Probably should try not to lose that, but I threw it on the floor anyway. 
And then here's the guide, which was wrapped in plastic and then yet more plastic. That seems to be a theme today. Ah, another sticker, of course. Very nice. And important notice. Ooh. Do not return it to your dealer. Contact our customer support staff. Yeah, um, I'll be returning it to B&H if this doesn't work. Oh. New product quick guide. I thought it was going to be a guide on this particular product, but it's actually a guide to, I guess, all their new products. So, yeah, we can just skip right over that. And uh, on the back of this other sheet of paper that's, that told us about the software, you can see where you download the software and manual and stuff. All right, to test this out, I've got a USB hub, which is dusty and connected to the computer just out of view. And I think the first step would be just to power this thing on. So now got this plugged in and plug it into the back of the unit. And let's see if anything happens. Nothing vis visible happened, but the DMX output indicators did start flashing. So I guess that's good. Oh, it looks like it started up in the interim. Because now number three is lit up, or did I hit it by accident? I, th I think I actually hit it by accident, but there's soft keys on the front. So you hit one, two, three, four, etc. I wonder if this comes pre-programmed with anything. Uh, let's try hooking it up and finding out. Plug into the back of there. Plug this into the first unit. Oops, got to plug these guys back in over here. And now these are all set to address one. So presumably they'll all do the same thing if they do anything at all. All right, this is now in DMX mode. And it looks like we've got some lights lit up and some not others. Let's try switching it. Sorry, the camera's swamping out a bit. Change it to three. Nope, that doesn't change anything. So apparently nothing's pre-programmed into this. All right, fair enough. Okay, I switched over to the Windows computer for now. It, I believe the software is for Mac or PC. I just happen to have that USB hub connected to my PC right now. And right on the product page is the download section. And yeah, software for PC or Mac. Oh, that's weird. The latest one is actually on the bottom, not the top. So it makes sense in a way. Uh, download speed isn't bad, about eight megabytes per second. Oh, just dropped down to seven. My internet connection should be able to do like 25 megabytes per second. So not exactly saturating it, but uh, not going too badly. The entire download is 774 megs. So it's a fairly chunky piece of software. Okay, it just downloads as a simple zip file, just extracting it in order to install it. And there's just one executable for installation. Okay, this might be an error some of you will encounter. Uh, Microsoft Defender Smart Screen prevented an unrecognized app from starting. Running this app may put your PC at risk. Why? What did Defender find? You know what, I'll look at that later. Let's do this on the Mac instead, um, just because I don't know what was up with that file being blocked and it makes me suspicious. So uh, rather than infect my PC, let's infect the Mac with potentially unwanted software. And just as a tip to American DJ, that's ADJ, um, not cool. Like whatever's up with your software, it's probably just doesn't have a Windows installer certificate, but I, I don't really know. I'll look into that later, rather than waste gigabytes of storage recording me trying to fiddle around with it. The Mac installer is significantly smaller at 429 megabytes uh, and downloaded much faster too, interestingly, even for its size. My DMX3 can't be open because Apple cannot check it for malicious software. Wonderful. Okay, so Mac OS doesn't want to install it either. Okay, install apps from any source, fine, whatever. All right, let's try this again. Screw it. Nope, still doesn't want to run. Great. Okay, it doesn't want to take it as an exception either. Reputation-based protection is off. Let's try an earlier version of the software. Maybe they actually bothered to sign that one. And it's significantly smaller at 513 megs. I believe the other one was, yeah, 774 megabytes. They also changed their naming convention for from a... Uh, more developer friendly date to a more user friendly date, which is just interesting. Interesting to me anyway. Okay, this is the May version of the software. Ah, this one actually wants to run. Hooray. 
It's just installing on the C drive, not even in program files. Interesting. Um, that might be a little small for you to read. It doesn't support display scaling, this installer. So it's installing in C colon backslash my DMX3, which I guess is fine. Oh, now it's display scaling parts of this interface, but not other parts. Yeah, so far, the, this software is not inspiring confidence. Um, SSL files. Okay, that's a little weird, but sure. Said so it will use 1.17 gigs of data to allow this, sure, whatever at this point. So far, not impressed, American DJ. I mean, a lot of, look, I don't necessarily blame you. A lot of hardware companies that make like, you know, lights and or other things that are not computerized tend to not spend too much money on their software development. They, they think it's a waste. It's not a waste. Or maybe you just can't afford it. If you can't afford it, don't release software. Don't create products that require software if you can't make good software for it. I mean, like, this is just the installer, and already I'm aggravated. And I'm a software developer, by the way, by trade, amongst other things. But, yeah, I, if I put this out, I would get yelled at. And it's still installing... What kind of resources is it using here? Like, is this installer particularly intensive? Well, it's multi-threaded, whatever it is. Yeah, apparently this is some real intense shit as far as the processor goes. It's hardly touching the SSD, though. So I don't know what it's doing right now. But it's definitely doing something. There's really not much else running on this machine other than Firefox, which has those two websites loaded. Sorry if you came here for a video about DMX switch boxes or dimmer packs. Uh, yeah, this is the kind of hoops or crap you're going to have to jump through in order to use the DMX controller here. Uh, even though I'm editing a lot of this out, I kind of want you to share my misery, but let's just skip ahead. Okay, welcome to the CUD driver setup window. Okay, I don't know what a CUD driver is. Uh, USB control. Okay, sure. If this is going to require a reboot at the end, I'm going to absolutely shit on top of this computer. Oh, finally, it's installing my DMX3. Oh, there we go. That took a half a second. It took forever to install the SSL components, whatever the hell those are. And we're done. All right, let's run my DMX 3.0, finally. Sure. Tiny little logo there. They do sell smaller interfaces, uh, USB to DMX. Oh my god, this is tiny. So their app does not support display scaling at all. All right, well, let me change the resolution of this computer then so that you guys can actually see what's going on. Fantastic. Okay, well, there we go. It wanted to sync up at a non-ideal 4x3 aspect ratio, but you know what? For now, let's just live with that. So, Universe 1, it shows all the patches. We got sliders for dimmers. So it's basically like a little lighting desk. We can edit together scenes, play them back live, and then, yeah, do a show. Great. Is that text supposed to be over those icons? Uh, is that supposed to be barely legible up here? I mean, I know they're deactivated right now, but can't even tell what it's supposed to be. Okay, well, as you can tell, I'm completely unimpressed with the software so far. I'm going to play around with it a little bit, and then we'll get back to it, and I'll show you it in action. So, be right back. I was actually mistaken before when I said the software needs registration. It's actually the device that gets registered. And I'm supposing you could use the software on however many computers you want, as long as the hardware itself is registered. Because as soon as I plug the unit in, it popped up this box to register, and then the unit number. And so I had to enter my email, my password, which I set up previously on their website. And then, of course, the key code that came on that card. And I guess that activates the hardware in their database online. And now it's registering the device. That takes a second, and then you're into the program. And every time the program opens, it prompts you with the type of license you have and whether you want to upgrade for $29 for a year or do any one of these other options, which are all cut off due to presumably the display scaling and the lack of support from this product. And then hitting OK doesn't bring you back into the app, weirdly. So uh, I have to go back in there manually. Not a big deal, just a little weird. Um, it actually closed out the app completely. As you can see, it's not there in the taskbar. And as the software starts up, you'll see once again, it gives this nagwary type uh, 
license prompt, even though I have a license. And here you can see the license prompt popped up again, and this time it froze the entire software package. And I had to force quit the program. So I tried starting it up again, of course, and the exact same thing happened. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but it's because the computer had gone into standby while the device was attached, and then when it came out of standby, suddenly it would like half work. It would go into the program. Sometimes initially the program would start working fine just for like a few seconds after you hit OK, which gives you a bit of confidence, and then it immediately prompts with that registration again, and uh, when you hit OK, it freezes the program. Just so I bring that up in case anyone else runs into that issue, a uh, simple fix for that is just unplugging the device and plugging it back in, preferably with the program closed. And then as I was perusing the user manual, which you kind of need to do because the software is not very intuitive, I found this on page 50, which is kind of what I bought this unit for. I'm sorry, page 51, which is what I bought the unit for, which is the standalone mode where you can press the buttons on the front to change the scenes. And apparently that's available as an upgrade for an additional charge. Wonderful. The sole reason I bought this exact piece of equipment and the functionality is not even included in the piece of equipment. It kind of uh, defeats the purpose of having this large piece of hardware relative to the smaller interfaces they sell, but hey, I guess everyone needs to make money. And in fact, there are a few other parts of the application that are additional charge extras, and they don't make that clear before you buy it. Um, I guess you could easily read the manual before you buy it, but uh, I did not and I imagine most people will not. So I was unaware that most of the functionality was, uh, not most of the functionality, but the functionality I needed and some of the other key options are extras and at an extra charge. So I decided to try full mode free for 30 days. And weirdly, when I clicked on that, it brought up the website where I could conveniently order a full mode, except this uh, dialog box is always on top. So you can move it out of the way, but you can't close it, I guess, without closing out of the... I wasn't sure if that would close out of the entire process or not. So I just decided to do this whilst that box was sitting on top of everything. And it was free. It didn't prompt me for any payment information. So at least it's not going to auto-charge my credit card because they don't have it on file. They did treat it like a paid order, though. So it's a little uncomfortable in that sense. Um, and then at the end, it informs you your interface needs synchronizing. Now that appeared to happen just by closing the program and reopening it, and it appeared to synchronize after that. So not a real problem, but uh, just something you should know if you run through this process. And now the program starts up, and you can see it's not prompting me to try the uh, full mode free for 30 days, but it shows me my license will expire in 29 days. I, I feel like I need to make a disclaimer, or at least sort of walk back part of the irritation I had before. The installer, very annoying. The nagware, every time you start it, even though you have a license, very annoying. The software, not intuitive to use, not well laid out. Um, if you have not seen it, check out Tentacruel's video on Sibelius. It's a masterclass in mocking bad user interfaces and user experiences. And that is the sort of medicine that this program could use. And then in the spot where most apps have a create or confirm button, they've opted comically for quit Sibelius. I just love this. It's as if they're saying, you've already seen the no category thing. Trust us, it only goes downhill from here. Now that being said, the part I wanted to walk back, even though it sounds like I'm being super critical of this application, is that it's actually fairly powerful. Like the functionality is there. And once it got past that initial issue with the um, computer having gone into standby and then crashing the program constantly. The program hasn't crashed on me since. It seems to be stable. And, you know, I guess in defense of developers or developer, if it was one guy or a very small team, I imagine they did the best they could and maybe they didn't have someone with a huge amount of UI, UX experience. I know I don't. Um, I did, you know, make a big comment that I'm a software developer just earlier. And indeed I am and UI UX is not one of my uh, areas of expertise. And I fully admit that, and I, and I know my limitations. And so I always make sure that if I'm gonna release a program with a UI UX, which is most of them, unless it's a command line program, that we bring in an actual designer to design that kind of thing. And it doesn't always work out great, but usually it does. And uh, that's what this software could use. It's just a little bit more in of an intuitive interface and just a bit of a better layout better iconography, um, 
icons that don't overlap text weirdly, which again might be a display scaling issue. I mean, that's another thing. This does not play well with Windows 10 display scaling. And Windows 10 display scaling has been out since I think the dawn of Windows 10, which is now quite a few years on. So a program that doesn't support that is uh, just outdated in my opinion. But like I said, it is powerful. It does have a lot of fixture profiles in it, which I was impressed by, including of course, the ones I actually need for this project. So ultimately it did work and it does do what I needed to do. I'm just hoping I don't have to pay $29 a year just to be able to push a few buttons on the front to get the scene set up. If it ends up coming down to that, what I'm going to do is actually just run the software on a computer over here and select the scenes that way, and this box will just be a dumb box that sits on the rack and I never touch it at all. Kind of disappointing in that sense, but uh, there wasn't too much else in the way of options. If anyone knows of a better option for like a single RU device that can control scenes via the front panel, um, that would be perfect. Something similar to this, but that doesn't require strange license agreements and uh, jumping through hoops to use. Sorry if we got bogged down in that part of the software, but I just want to make it clear to you that if you're considering buying this unit, um, there are some caveats and some things to look out for, and the software is one of them. As I said, one of those text title things, the software I don't think was made by ADJ. It was made by a separate company called DMX Soft. So this is the company that I actually registered the software with. So I'm guessing they write the software. I don't know if they're affiliated with ADJ or not, but at any rate, um, it's their software. So they're the ones to blame or love. Also, why did this come up with double forward slash at the end? There's just a lot of weirdness surrounding this software and this website. Um, so yeah, not the biggest fan if you couldn't tell. But it does work, it does do what it says it will do, and I can't really fault them for that. Okay, rant over, let's take a look at the actual software. Now, once I got the hang of it, it was relatively easy to use. The first step is patching in any fixtures you have, and you can search for them here. So like, I'm gonna search for the DMX4, which is by Chauvet. And this is, I, I should just show you a quite a comprehensive list of manufacturers and then lighting fixtures under each manufacturer. So like I said, I was fairly impressed with that. I don't think they compiled that. I think that's a uh, database that's available and out there. So we select the DMX4, and it's not clear what these modes are, but mode three appears to be the one I want. I believe those modes actually translate to the various personalities of the device, where mode one is single channel, mode two is two channel, and mode three is four channel. So it doesn't correspond to this numbering, but uh, in my experience just from playing around with it, if you select mode one, it only gives a single channel for the entire device, and mode two, two channels, and mode three is four channels. So we want to select mode three for four channels, and it lets you, at, you can either drag and drop them, so you can drag and drop this onto, and this is a list of all the DMX addresses that are available in this universe, so there are 512 of them. So you can drag and drop this, I need 16 of these. That would be a pain, so here's where some of the software design comes in handy. Um, you can set the first DMX channel and the number of fixtures. In this case, I already added one manually, so I need to add 15 more. And then I will hit patch. And you can see at the top of the screen it was a little cut off, but it added the other 15 channels. And then down here, it shows a representation of each fixture. And then if we go down to edit, you can see on the left here, there's a scene option. And so you can create as many scenes as you want and group them. And so what I'm looking for is very simple functionality. It's going to be just turning on and off a certain set of these lights. So there's going to be no dimming, no flashing, nothing elaborate at all. None of these lights are pan tilt heads. None of them have any RGB functionality, obviously, because they're just dimmer packs. And I'm not even going to be dimming. So for me, this is very simple. You can have much more complicated arrangements where you might have a, you know, 20 channel pan tilt head with uh, various colors and other options and it would support that. So each scene can have different steps to it. Again, I'm only concerned with one step for my purposes. And then if we click off of that and then click back on, you can select individual fixtures and then control their state for each step. 
And here you can see there's a fade time of zero, so it'll come on instantly and a hold time of one minute, but this step is gonna loop over and over again so that this way it'll just remain constantly on. For this scene, which is gonna be the first scene here, I'm gonna put on channel one on each of the dimmer packs. And you do that just by selecting each channel and turning it on. And then we could add another scene. And here I'm gonna turn on channel three on two of the dimmer packs. And I'll add a third scene where I'll turn on, I don't know, this channel. And this, by the way, this turning to white is a visual representation of the light. So if this was an RGB fixture, it would show what color it was. Um, since this is, of course, just a dimmer pack, it's just showing white just to mean on because it doesn't know what color it would produce. And then I'm going to add a fourth scene with everything off. So scene four is going to be the equivalent of just turning everything off. Now, one thing we need to do here is assign each scene to a button on the front panel. And this is the part that I believe costs the extra money, is the port mapping. So we could set port triggering, and this refers to the front... Oh, whoops, I don't have the device plugged in, so therefore it's not showing up. Let me plug... I just plugged in the device via USB, and we should see it bring up the nagware prompt. Hopefully it doesn't crash the program. Okay, it will expire in 29 days. So now we can select the device, which is coming up as unknown for some reason. Probably I should have done this in a different order. Let's try the port triggering again. There we go, my DMX3 racks. Now it's showing the appropriate name. And you can see there are 16 ports to select from, which are the 16 buttons on the front of the unit. So I wanna, I'm going to correspond each port, which is actually each button, to each of these scenes. So it's going to be scene 1, 2, 3, and 4. So it's going to correspond to buttons 1, 2, 3, and 4. So right now we have scene 1 selected and I'm going to assign that to port 1. Hit OK. And we've got to come down to scene 2 and do the same thing. And as I click on each scene, I should note it's actually changing the lights in real time. So let me select port 2. And then we'll head on over to this camera, which shows all the lights. And so right now I'm going to go to scene one. I'm pressing scene two on that interface. Scene three and scene four, which is off as it should be. And I should note there's a star next to each port that's already been assigned. So we already know that ports one, two, and three have been assigned. And now we're on port four for scene four. And that's all there is to it to do what I need this to do, which is just to create a scene of just various lights being on or off and have them selectable by buttons on the front. So now that's all set up, we go to Tools, Standalone, and here is the device on the right and the show on the left. And so we can select all the scenes, drag them over here, and then hit right. Okay. Don't know what that's about. Just erase what's on the device already. And then rewrite it. Impossible to write the message. Please remove the empty. It does not like the fact that scene four doesn't have any explicit controls in it. Okay, you can't drag this out of here. Oh man, okay. It seems like you should be able to. Standalone. All right, let's see if I just drag the three scenes that have actual lights turned on on them. And then we do right. Okay, that wrote successfully. And I'm guessing once I drag scene four in, it's gonna get angry and not wanna write that scene because it's empty. Um, okay. But it should be empty because I want all the lights off at this juncture. There might be some way to explicitly state that all the lights are off now. Uh, I don't know how. Maybe if I just jiggle this, that there's a, it thinks there was an action done. Ah, yes, okay. So I just jiggled it up and down, and I guess that created something in this thing's memory. So now scene four should be there, theoretically. Okay, now let's take a look at the device itself in standalone mode. Right now there are no buttons lit up on the front, and I'm gonna disconnect the USB cable from the back. 
immediately the lights turned on. I'm not sure why, but I'm going to hit button four and that turns them all off because of course that's scene four, which is the scene where everything's off. So now if we go to scene one, that should light up channel one on all the units and indeed it did. It actually lit up channel four on this unit, but I think this unit is having some kind of issue. Um, that unit in the, in the far corner there definitely is not working right. And we will explore that in a few minutes. Scene two should swap things around a little bit. And scene three. And again, scene three should have two bulbs lit up, one on this unit and one on this one. And uh, it should have channel three on both of them, I think I set it up for. Or at least, well, one of these bulbs should be on. And it is not. But that comes down to a fault of the Chauvet unit, the dimmer pack, not this my DMX RM unit. So uh, don't chalk it up to that. But anyway, this is basically what I wanted, the ability to press buttons on a front panel that's in a rack and have different lighting scenes turn on or off. OK, for me, mission accomplished. Uh, the software is way more robust. As I said, you can accomplish a lot more with it. But this is all I need right now is some lights turning on and off. So let's take a look at the faulty Chauvet unit and try to determine what's up with that, or at least uh, look at what it's doing and what it's not doing. And then I'll move along, and I'll get the uh, Chauvet unit opened up and connect uh, these actual lights around me to these units and control them via the, uh, well, controller. So yeah, let's go. OK, so here is the faulty dimmer pack. And right now, it's actually, before, it wasn't lighting up all the segments on the display. And now it is. That's a, a slight change as to behavior. What I'm going to do is change this to the program mode. And previously, it appeared that two channels were bad when I started this thing up. But right now, this bulb here is not lighting, even though they should be chasing around in a pattern. And in fact, the LED isn't lighting up. So you see they should be chasing across, it looks like. And just channel 2 is not lighting up. But I could have sworn channel 3 or 4 weren't lighting up before either. I wonder if it's a mechanical fault. Maybe not. So yeah, a bit odd. Um, and as we saw before, when controlled via DMX, it also was not lighting up the correct bulbs at the correct times. So what I want to do is open this unit up and let's see what's inside. OK, well, removing the rear bracket seems to pretty much show everything that's going on in here. OK, and here it is somewhat closer up. We have some actually decent looking receptacles, although they are connected via backstab, which is generally not what I like to see. But OK. Uh, all the neutrals look like they're going back to a common location on the board, which is to be expected. It's interesting they didn't jumper the neutrals from one receptacle to the other. They actually sent them back to the uh, board itself. I wonder if that means the neutrals are fused, maybe? But no, it looks like the line wires are actually fused because uh, they're black anyway. And there is a small transformer on the back, which presumably is to provide power to the low voltage circuitry. And there's four chokes, four medium-sized capacitors, so uh, clearly one for each channel. And the DMX is just looped through. So there's no opto-isolation or anything. These are just hardwired from one to the other. I'm a, I don't know if that, is that common practice in DMX. You tell me. I know in, I'm thinking of MIDI, where they're optically isolated from each other, but um, probably not the case here, right? And then mounted on this large heat sink are what I'm imagining are four transistors or MOSFETs or triacs. Uh, probably triacs, I guess. That would be the most reasonable thing for a dimmer pack. All right, well, before I drive myself too crazy, I guess the first thing I should check is just if there's continuity on the fuse for channel two. And it doesn't say which channel is which, so I'll just check all of them. Yep, got continuity there, there, n there. Yeah, unfortunately, we have continuity through all the fuses. And I say unfortunately because that would be a very easy fix. Now let's get a little dangerous here, and I'm going to change it over to AC volts and power this thing on and make sure it's in standalone mode. Huh. Well, let's see if I can safely invert this. Well, now it looks like this is back in program one, which should be chase mode. 
and channels one and two are both non-functional. Even though I didn't do anything inside this unit, I just opened it up and I just probed the fuses. So there's really no reason why channel one should have stopped working. So it's definitely not a problem going to the output because that LED is not even lighting up. Let me just make sure each fuse is actually passing current. Yep, that's showing 120 volts, 120, 120, and 120. And I'm just gonna stick my head in here for a second. And I just wanna see, try not to short anything out. Okay, so that, hmm, interesting. Okay, so probing the center leg of what I assume are triax of this one and this one both revealed 120 volts to ground, but these two revealed zero volts to ground. So is it a faulty triac? But then again, it's probably not a faulty triac because that LED should be lighting up even if the triac is faulty and it just wouldn't be outputting any line voltage. So I'm guessing the problem goes deeper than that but it's intermittent for sure on channel one. So perhaps just bad soldering joints. One thing I'm not liking about the construction of this is, let me unplug it for a moment so I can poke around in there and point the stuff. These pin headers down here are not trim. They're super long, uh, as are these over here. Don't know if that's extremely visible for you, but they're clearly not trimmed. And that's not a problem necessarily in of itself, except for example, this pin that, f this is the display, these pins on the back here. And this one pin is bent quite out of whack. And if it was bent the other way, it would end up touching the pin next to it and creating a short. And that could or could not prove quite disastrous. Okay, so the white packages in there are opto isolators, so it could be a bad opto isolator. Let's see what kind of voltage we're getting on the opto isolators. And I'll check the pinout first to see what exactly we're looking for. Okay, well here's a handy circuit diagram of a medium high power triac drive, car drive circuit, which is presumably what we're looking at here. So we should be getting plus VCC on pin one and pin two should be ground. So yeah, so let's go to DC volts on the old meter and see what's up. Of course, I gotta plug this thing in and be very careful because of course, those are all sorts of line voltage going on inside. Let me just make sure I'm on a sequence. Yep, they should be lighting up right now. Let me try to keep my big head out of the way. All right, a bit anticlimactic, but I did mess around with this thing and I tried to figure out what was wrong with it. I couldn't, I think, I still think it's a loose solder joint somewhere in there because a lot of these solder joints are just uh, dry and poorly done. Like a lot of the surface mount components, the actual leads aren't even fully covered in solder and the lead looks like it's just like barely stuck on there with a tiny lick of solder. And that's in almost all of these surface mount components over here. I, I thought it might be a problem with one of the op opto isolators. So I did reflow the solder on all of those that did not help. And um, rather than reflow the solder on everything, I couldn't find anything visually wrong by inspecting it and poking and prodding at it. I couldn't get it to activate channel two at all. Channel one continued to be intermittent. So um, I'm gonna put away my multimeter and not even bother with the oscilloscope. And we'll call it a day on this thing because I'm, I'm all about, if you saw my video on the Amazon Glow, doing destructive teardowns when it's fun or you know necessary. But in this case, I can actually return this unit to B&H and get a replacement. So that's what I'm gonna do, and I don't wanna dig too far into it and risk breaking something physically where they're gonna question the return. So uh, yeah, this is, this, I'm just gonna consider this a lost cause, but like I said, because it's a brand new piece of equipment, I'm just gonna use the return policy and just get a new one. It's not worth repairing for that reason. And so it's certainly not worth destroying by accident. Where I did have failure in that arena, I had success in the, well, main subject of this video, which is to get all the lights in here operating off of this DMX controller in standalone mode. And so right now I have all the lights on, which is one of the settings, that's button number one. If I switch over to button number two, that's gonna be all lights off. You can see the button floating there in midair though. Three is just the lights in front of me, if you couldn't tell from the way it's lit. And as you can see, that looks kind of ghastly. 
Uh, number four, and these are just for fun. Number four is lights sort of in the middle of the room and including a couple of colored accent lights. Like I have uh, blue there and red there. And the idea behind those is just that they cast like interesting colored reflections on whatever object I'm holding. And then um, the last channel is, of course, the lights behind me, which creates a sort of dramatic view. And you can see some flickering back there. That's unusual. Um, that shouldn't be happening. One moment. It's this. I just got this. It's an ultraviolet LED bar, or a blacklight LED bar, which should just help provide some uh, extra interest in the background here. And for some reason, it's, oh, well, now it stopped flickering. It was flickering, though, as if it was being dimmed, although all these channels should be fully on right now. In fact, I suspect some chicanery with the either the Chauvet dimmer packs or this device, where I have everything set to be at level 255, which is to say maximum brightness, which should be just 120 volts. I suspect that it's still chopping up the signal with that triac a little bit, at least a tiny bit, because I'm getting a little bit of flicker off one of the soft boxes in front of me, which is the one on the left. It's not doing it right now, but it was doing it a second ago. And on the one on the right, I had an LED bulb in the center of it, which was also flickering badly, and it's this one. It's sort of an older generation LED bulb and uh, fairly cheap and poor quality, but this was flickering quite badly, even when it's supposed to be uh, at 100% illumination. Not sure what's up with that. That's going to require some further investigation. I'm not sure if the controller is perhaps not telling the dimmer packs to go to maximum brightness, or perhaps the dimmer packs, even when instructed to go to maximum brightness, are not in fact providing a full sine wave. Um, that would explain also the flickering of the unit in the back. Not sure, but I will investigate and update my website at s.co.tt with more information as I figure things out. For now, though, I'm going to call this a video. I think I've covered enough stuff here. If you're interested in the My DMX, what is it called? My DMX RM controller, I hope this was at least somewhat edifying. And uh, if you're interested in the Chauvet DJ DMX4 dimmer pack slash switch packs, I hope this was also helpful. And like I said, check out my website because hopefully I'll have gotten to the bottom of why it's doing that little flickering thing. I can see the flickering right now out of the corner of my eye. I don't think it'll come out on camera because the flickering is very subtle and very brief. But uh, just to take my word for it, it's, it's something's not right here. And realistically, I should change all of these soft boxes over to proper LED light bulbs. The DMX4 dimmer packs did say they're compatible with LED bulbs. Those soft boxes do have some CFLs and some LED bulbs. So I'm suspecting that it might be a CFL or two. But then again, I have another one of these in one of those soft boxes, so it could be the other one of these LED bulbs. But that is a story for another day. Thank you for watching this video. I've been Scott, and uh, you can like and subscribe and stuff. Um, and like I said, my website, s.co.tt. Yes, that's a real URL. And uh, yeah, till next time.